So we're preaching about uh, James today. Kate kicked us off last Sunday in the book of James talking about righteousness and what it means to be righteous. Today we are going to talk about the soul and how one goes about saving a soul. It's a complicated conversation for us as Episcopalians because we don't really meddle in people's business, do we? We're not like out there up in people's chops about how they need to reform and move away from the devil and return to the Lord. That's not our way. We, we don't talk about them that way. Well, at least not to their face. That's for another sermon. We'll get to that another time. Today, it's, what do you get? Come on, choir. Today we're going to talk about the soul, and, and I want to give an outline, uh, one type of outline through which we go about saving souls. And to do that, uh, sort of like Kate did last week, I want to use a real world example, somebody that some of us uh, knew, some of uh, us know about. Uh, it's, a, it's a woman who I describe as sort of like that character uh, who is the queen of heaven in C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. Have any of you read The Great Divorce? Fabulous book. I strongly recommend you read it. John Roberts, uh, I think it's his birthday today, isn't it? Right on. John Roberts, who teaches the Minion, uh, the C.S. Lewis Minion, uh, has taught that book. It's a fabulous book. Well, anyway, in The Great Divorce, chapter 12, there is this grand procession in heaven. And in this procession, a woman appears, and she's surrounded by these, an entourage of bright spirits. They come up around her, and she's walking with them as if she's a queen, and the protagonist asks the narrator, who is this? To which the narrator explains, well, you wouldn't know her. She wasn't famous on earth, just an ordinary person who lived a life full of love and kindness. Not bad. When I arrived at Epiphany a long time ago now, 2008, I was sitting up in my office one day, looking out at the back window. It was in December, sort of gray outside. And I saw a woman drive up to the parking lot, which back in the old days, there was a big old fence around it, some of you may remember. And she got out and uh, she pulled through and she shut the gate. She was in a Subaru. She pulled in and she parked and opened the hatch and out tumbled a bunch of dogs, like more dogs than I could ever imagine one could fit in a Subaru, sort of like one of those clowns in a Mini Cooper kind of thing, and they surrounded her, those dogs running around like a bunch of bright spirits. And I noticed then it happened the next day. Same woman, same time, same place. And then the day after that, and the day after that, right, about an hour, hour and a half before Epiphany School let out. So finally, I'm curious, and I go out there to introduce myself, and she says her name is Ruth. And she brought her canines there to that enclosed place to exercise them, and she told me she owned an animal uh, care service, I think called Grandma's Critter Care. Am I right? And the first thing that went through my mind when she told me that was, well, she's running a business on our property. We probably should charge her. Not a soul-saving way of thinking, incidentally. But that was uh, back when I was still new enough to know uh, that I probably should ask somebody before I did anything. So I think I talked to Jenny Cummings, I think it was Jenny, uh, about her, and she said, oh yeah, yep, that's uh, Ruth Dalton, and she's an institutional figure in the neighborhood, you probably shouldn't charge her. <laughs> Good advice. So instead, I got to know her. I'd take my little dog, Mickey, some of you remember Mickey, little white Bichon, and I'd take him out and let him run with the big dogs, and she and I would talk. You see, there's something about dogs uh, that bring people together. And what I learned in those conversations is that Ruth was a Christian, and she was a person of prayer, and occasionally we would pray together. If she got cancer, we would pray together. When her son got cancer, we would pray together. We would pray for me. We'd pray for Epiphany. When his son died, we prayed again. Prayer of thanksgiving for the, his eternal presence with God. Ruth was a person of faith 
who believed in eternal life, and she believed in the goodness of the human soul. She was a saver of souls, and we can be as well. Now you're wondering, I'm sure, what does it mean to be a saver of souls? Anybody wondering that? Not this group. Just for you online. (laughs) Well, it's a small thing that does a big thing. It happens in the moment when someone is reminded how much they are loved by God. And in that way, for an eternal moment, the release valve of love that connects our souls to God is open and love flows. To save a soul is to be like a plumber, turning the spigot of God's love wide open and flooding somebody with a moment of eternity. Now, how's that happen? Well, Ruth lays it out for us. Four things that allowed her to be the the queen of heaven. They are being accessible, being conversational, being faithful, and being prayerful. Got that accessible, conversational, faithful, and prayerful. You see, with Ruth, every single day, she would sort of travel the same route. And every day she would see people because she was out and about in the world. She was in the community. She was there year in and year out, a fixture, present, available. And she was known, right? People who walk dogs are known because you can go up to them, right? And you talk to them about their dog and you say, what kind of dog is that? Or how old is your dog? Or what's your favorite dog? Or how long have you had your dog? I like your dog. (laughs) And that that can lead to, to deeper engagement. And that's not because dog is God spelled backwards. <laughs> or, or, or maybe it is. But Ruth was available out there. She was consistent and she was present and she had this open sort of invitation for conversation through the brightness of dogs. And when you would engage with her, she'd listen and she was curious and she got to know about me and Epiphany and my family and what was on my heart. But the beauty of that is there was a mutuality in the conversation, right? Because everybody she met to her was just like her in that they were too a beloved child of God. And as such, it seemed reasonable, if not natural, to share her faith. She never did so towards the end of conversion. It was always as a framework, framework through which she lived lived her life in the world. And then she would say, can I pray for you? Would you like to pray together? And that was her plumber's pry bar to tap the valve of a soul to loosen the spigot so the love of God could flow. So here's the the pattern, right? The pattern for saving souls is being accessible, right? Living a patterned life, a predictable life, like coming to church every Sunday. It is a predictable way of engagement. And then there's being quick to conversation. If you're wondering why we have coffee hour, it's so we can have those conversations. And then there's faith. And faith is knowing that where you are at any given moment in time is exactly where God wants you. And that whoever you are engaging with at any given moment in time is that person that God wants you to be engaging with. And then it's, it's comfort. It's comfort sharing your faith because we know that everybody we are engaging with has faith in something, don't they? We just happen to have it in Jesus. And finally, it's praying for them. Maybe it's asking if we can pray for them. Maybe it's praying with them. Maybe it's just going home and praying with them, praying, using that pry bar to open the soul to the love of God. And you know how I know Ruth was a saver of souls? By the fruit of her life. See, a few weeks ago, 80-year-old Ruth pulled over to the side of the road down here in Madison Valley, right there on Harrison and Martin Luther King Drive, and in her Subaru, packed in the back with a bunch of dogs. 
And she pulled over there, her granddaughter told me, probably to do what she does every single day, to take out her daily devotionals and say her prayers. Every day she'd say her prayers. And then after she was done saying her prayers, she'd take out her, her phone and type a little message of, of love or grace or wisdom to whoever happened to be on her text chain. So one day she's down there praying and some fool comes and knocks on her window and he probably asked her to get out of the car and she did, I suppose, and a fight ensued. As this guy tried to steal her car with a bunch of dogs in it, she battled like the queen of heaven, right? Can't you just see her, right? I love that idea. She wasn't afraid. Why wasn't she afraid? Love knows no fear. She loved those dogs. And as they're wrestling out there, I guess, a plumber walks by. I'm not kidding. A plumber walks by, and he sees the melee, and he jumps in to help her out. And another person springs the trunk, and the dogs pile out. And somehow the bad guy gets in the car, and he slams the door, and the keys are there, and he drives away. And as he speeds away, he runs over Ruth. And the neighbors come to rescue her, but it's too late. And I heard about it right away. Because when a soul saver jumps to eternity, news travels fast, even if they're not famous, maybe because they are not famous. And because Ruth was accessible, uh, conversational, faithful, and prayerful, people instantly missed her. So they planned a parade. They planned a parade in their honor. They met down at Harrison and Madison, the place where Ruth's soul ascended to God. Right there, they met there, and they marched to uh, Madison Park. And a lot of people turned up for this. The mayor showed up. Chief of police showed up. City council members showed up. The city attorney showed up. A lot of you showed up. And they walked and they carried a sign out in front of them that somebody had made and said, I want to be like Ruth. I want to be like Ruth. And I wondered when I saw that sign if they knew that it really said, I want to be a follower of Jesus. Because that's what Ruth was. Right? She was, in many ways, the person she was because she was a person of faith. Practicing Christian. And you know, there's a way to be like Ruth. We've been doing it for 2,000 years. So I was asked to go down there and do an opening prayer at the gathering. And in that prayer, it was great. I got to remind folks that the bad thing is never the last thing. Have you heard that? That's right. Bad things are never the last thing. And that all of them were loved by God. And Ruth was a living example and a reminder of that reality. And at the end of the prayer, I said, Amen. And a chorus of bright spirits sung through the barking of dogs. I kid you not, they went off. (laughs) And then the city officials spoke. And it remains true, even in our culture today, even in the city of Seattle today, when faced with the unknowable, the confusing, the unreasonable, the mysterious, Christianity still offers a language for talking about what we do not know how to talk about. Junior Warden Mary Kimball was there. She said to me, the only person that didn't quote the Bible was you. (laughs) (laughs) Ugh. Jad Baklini, our communication director, was there. He said, he said the, uh, it was the most Christian event he has ever attended in the city of Seattle outside of church. We didn't qualify that, but I'm assuming that. <laughs> See, Ruth had a kind of impact because she saved souls. And she saved souls because it was what she did, because it was part of her life as a follower of Jesus. And she did it by being accessible and conversational and faithful and prayerful. She touched so many lives by being this way, by engaging souls, by praying for souls. She tapped into the souls, into the waterline of God's infinite love and shared an eternal moment with a neighbor 
one neighbor at a time. And you can save souls as well by being accessible, conversational, faithful, and prayerful. Take a moment, take a moment in your day, in the pattern of your life, to remind somebody how much they're loved by God. Turn the release valve that's attached to their souls for an eternal moment. Let them be surrounded by the bright lights. For an eternal moment, let them be like Ruth.